Hi there. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, ER could not be uh, with us, so uh, I am presenting on his uh, behalf. Um, hopefully, uh, the topic I'm going to present, uh, I, am quite, I am quite familiar, familiar with. Um, so this should go smoothly. Uh, this is about uh, creating a secure uh, namespace isolation uh, in Lustre. And this is a um, real life uh, customer use case that uh, I'm going to present. Um, so um, as Andreas uh, said this morning in his presentation, um, today the data centers are um, have uh, bigger and bigger uh, list of file systems. And uh, sometimes that's because uh, data centers have to support multiple organizations. So uh, the idea is that it would be really nice to have all the organizations use the same list of big a big list of file system uh, because that would be better for efficiency and resource usage. But at the same time, we really need to keep data uh, from these different organizations to keep these data uh, separated uh, for, uh, you know, uh, security reasons, for uh, confidentiality, for, uh, for, uh, for, for multiple reasons. Um, so what we would like to implement is an isolation at the client, at the network, and also at the storage uh, levels. So um, the basic idea is to... Um, uh, create isolated but also constrained storage space uh, in inside a single list of file system and that would uh, address different uh, groups or different projects. Um, obviously we need to restrict uh, clients so that they can only access the data they are supposed to, uh, the data of their organization and not another and not another. Um, and, um, it's really important to make this uh, restriction and, and this access uh, secure uh, so that uh, not only it works, but also we know that it's not possible to work around this isolation and uh, for malicious user to get access to uh, another uh, organization's data. So uh, we have been working on uh, many different uh, Luster security features. Uh, over the past years. And uh, it's nice to see how we could combine those different uh, features that are already available uh, to implement this, um, uh, this uh, secure namespace isolation. So ultimately, the goal of this presentation is to provide a step-by-step a step-by-step -step guide that will show you how it's possible to implement a secured namespace isolation and uh, to convince you that it's not uh, something uh, super fancy to, to implement. So for the sake of this presentation, let's consider that uh, we want to support two different organizations on the same Luster file system. And so each organization has its own set of Luster clients that we are calling tenants. Um, for um, regarding administra administration, um, it turns out that we would need uh, multiple different uh, administrators role. Uh, one uh, super admin that we would call the, the sysadmin, one security admin uh, to deal with security stuff, I will explain later, and one uh, administrator that could be that could be called the uh, local or tenant administrator. Um, obviously, in order for this uh, Luster implementation to be secure, it needs that the configuration of the network uh, below Luster, the network being used by Luster, is also secured. So on the left hand side, you have a diagram that represents how you would need to configure um, the network for your clients. So here in this example, we are using VLANs so, so that the network for the different tenants are isolated. Uh, so in order to make sure that they cannot talk to each other and uh, in order also to, uh, to control the way each tenant connects to the Luster servers. So this is very important to, uh, so that it's not possible for a malicious user to 
connect to um, and get access to uh, uh, another tenant's data. So once this is done, we have to tackle the uh, uh, storage isolation itself. Uh, so the idea would be to uh, be able to assign um, a given capacity to each organization. So remember, this is a shared Lustre file system. And we do not want uh, one organization to use the whole uh, storage capacity and uh, prevent the other organization from uh, working on uh, and creating new files. Um, also, it's very important that each tenant doesn't have access to the root of the Lustre file system. We want to present them only a um, subdirectory of the global namespace so that they think that they are the only users and they are uh, seeing it all, but actually it's just a subdirectory that they have access to. Um, UID GID management is an interesting um, requirement. So because it's not already uh, complicated enough, uh, we have this requirement that the tenants can uh, create all the UIDs and GIDs that they want. They can use them. They can uh, assign permissions uh, on files just as they want. And uh, it's their own responsibility to, uh, to, to manage the, the, the file permissions and the UIDs, GIDs, etc inside their um, their group and icing on the cake they also want uh, everything to be encrypted from the very uh, top of the uh, subdirectory mounts so let's see how this can be implemented the first step and uh, the most obvious one is to create one directory on the lust of file system that will be dedicated to each tenant um, and um, then we will um, assign a project ID to each directory uh, that corresponds to each tenant. And we set project quotas on this directory. And so this is how we guarantee that each tenant will be, will be limited to its initial capacity and cannot you know, uh, create more, uh, use more space on the, on the Lustre file system that it was, um, it was supposed to. Uh, just a few words about um, the root user. In our case, I told you that uh, we want the uh, tenants to, uh, we want, let's say, we want to delegate to the tenants the management of their uh, users, the UIDs, the GIDs, etc. Which means that um, we cannot use root squash in our case. We cannot squash the root user inside the tenant. Otherwise, this root user could not set uh, and do all the uh, UID GID related operations that, uh, that are necessary for the normal uh, um, uh, workflows that, that are running in, in, on, on the list of clients. Uh, so, because we are not, we cannot use root scratch. It means that there will be uh, inevitably um, files created with UID zero on the file system, and this is uh, a problem for um, quota uh, enforcement because there is quota accounting for UID zero, but there isn't uh, any quota enforcement for uh, for UID zero. It's uh, something that's inherited from. Um, from uh, ext4 but it's not um it's not uh it, for, and for instance it, it exists in uh, xfs but in luster it's uh it's not working so we developed a patch um that that was landed in 2.16 and the the purpose of this patch is to um, enforce a project quota um for uh, for the root user so uh, there is a tuning parameter, so you can decide to, uh, to, to have that or not. Uh, but once it's enabled, um, you would get ED quote error if um, a file written by the root user exceeds the, the project quota that has been uh, uh, defined. So now uh, let's get back to our step-by-step uh, -step procedure. We uh, need to identify the Lustre clients and assign them 
uh, some uh, properties. So the very obvious luster feature to use for that is the node map feature. Uh, the node map feature lets you uh, gather luster clients by uh, identifying with their uh, network, uh, their network identifiers and assign properties to them. So I'm not going to give all the details of the uh, node map configuration, just you have here on this slide just the important uh, parameters. Um, as you can see, admin and trusted properties are set to one, which means that we, we keep um, the root user, we do not squash it. Uh, the only thing we do uh, regarding squashing is that we squash the project ID. So this is because this is because we do not want the users to to create files um, with a different project ID that would let them bypass, you know, the uh, the the, the Cotown project and and write more data than than expected. And the the last property, important property listed here, is the file set property. So this uh, property uh, will make Luster clients in the in 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 the node map only see the subdirectory that is mentioned here. So, for instance, you have slash tenant one hundred. So it means that when the clients inside this node map mount Luster, they directly see the subdirectory named tenant one hundred. They do not see the root of the Luster file system. So as I explained earlier, we have this uh, local tenant administrator. And uh, because of this role, we cannot use root, root scratch. Um, but it's, it doesn't mean that we want to allow this uh, tenant administrator to have all power over the Luster file system. We still want to restrict its ability to uh, to basically uh, uh, break the Luster file system or uh, do uh, nas nasty things, because this is uh, this is not because it's is considered um, a local uh, and tenant administrator that we uh, we grant uh, any power to 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 this admin. So for this purpose, we introduced a new property to the nod map feature uh, that could be called role-based admin control or RBAC. And um, you can see that property as a, as a mask of uh, capabilities for uh, the root user. So really you have a root user, it's not squashed. It's, it's not squashed. And um, you still want to limit the things that this, this guy can do. So for instance, uh, we have the uh, by feed ops uh, bit and if you remove this uh, bit from the mask it means that um, the the root uh, in this uh, node map will not be able to um, to do uh, by feed operations such as uh, you know the dot luster slash feed accessing the dot luster slash feed directory or using the rm feed command uh, similarly if you remove the change lock ops uh, bit the admin will not be able to have access to change logs because you know change logs are kind of uh, they, they list all all what is happening on the luster file system from a metadata point of view so it can be uh, uh, a concern for uh, security or privacy that someone can read uh, those change logs um, if you remove the dne ops uh, bit then it means that the admin will not be able to uh, uh, create um, striped directories for instance we also have the quota ops bit so uh, with this disabled it's not possible for the root user to change the quota definitions so this was for instance in our use case it was very it was one of the uh, requirements that this local admin could not tamper with the uh, predefined uh, quotas. Uh, we have a role that is FS script admin. And so without this role, it's not possible for the root user to uh, modify the encryption policies that have been defined. So this is also something that we need. I will explain just after. And the last one is the file perms bit. So without the this bit, it would not be possible for the administrator to for, for the root user to um, to change UID GID, so to use schmod or um, uh, shown uh, comments. 
So this uh, new feature is also landed in, in 2.16. And uh, for um, this uh, this step-by-step uh, -step guide, you can see that we only use the file perms uh, role for, for the administrator. This is the only uh, role that we want to grant to this uh, tenant administrator. So, uh, basically in the clients, we mount Luster and uh, you can see here we, mount, we are mounting on one tenant uh, and then the other. And if we do DF, we can see that um, uh, there is, there, thanks to a patch that, that landed in 2.14, we can, the, um, the administrator and the users see only the, the project quota that was allocated for their tenant. Uh, so it makes this, uh, this view very consistent with the quota that has, uh, that has been um, uh, defined. And you can also see from this slide that when you ls the, the content of your mount point, you only see the subdirectory. This is completely automatic. As you can see from the mount command, this is, uh, this is just mounting the root of the Luster file system. But internally, thanks to the node map definition, Luster will interpret that and only show the subdirectory defined in the node map. So the last remaining bit is uh, about encryption. Um, and for encryption to be implemented, we actually need several roles because we have this uh, kind of uh, super administrator, what we, is called here the sysadmin. And um, this guy is not responsible for the, um, for, the, uh, for the security and for defining the encryption policies. There is a dedicated admin that is called here sec admin. And his role is to uh, define the encryption policies and decide which directories to encrypt. Um, so the workflow is this sysadmin, the sysadmin uh, uh, mounts Luster and then we can switch or the sec admin can, can uh, log into the node in order to uh, create the uh, FS script policies and protectors. So these are the required steps so that we can uh, later on assign uh, uh, we, we can later on decide on which directories are going to be encrypted. So I guess you already, you have already enough of encryption with my presentations yesterday, presentation mm -hmm. yesterday. I'm not going into the details, just to mention, this is the role of the SEC admin to define the encryption policies and protectors. And after that, this SEC admin, uh, this um, uses the FS script commands to encrypt the, um, the subdirectories that are assigned to each tenant. When it's done, the, di the directories can be locked and the sec admin role can be, uh, can be uh, left uh, aside. Uh, so obviously these steps were for one tenant. You have to run the same steps for the other tenants in your, in your cluster. And now if we mount Luster, Again, this is the very um, the, the simplest mount command uh, for the client. If we try to write data inside the directory, we can see that it's not possible. This is because this very directory is uh, encrypted. So thanks to another development that was made earlier, it's possible um, to ha to for Luster to handle that. And as you can see, the the, the root. Uh, inside the tenant can unlock the directory, so can unlock the um, the root of the uh, of the file system as seen by the client. So remember, this is not the root of the file system. This is just a subdirectory. It can be unlocked, and then data can be can be written and and, and read uh, from there. And the thanks to this separation between the different admin roles, it's you can see it's not possible for the sysadmin to have access to uh, the encrypted data because this sysadmin uh, is a super admin, that's fine, but it doesn't mean that he might have access to uh, data that are that is encrypted by end users and tenants. So if this sysadmin tries to have access to, um, 
to the files from the management node, for instance, it, it, it would re return in no key because this sysadmin doesn't have the keys. The keys are only uh, uh, um, in the possession of the sec admin and the local uh, tenant admin. So as a conclusion, uh, we can say that thanks to the, the work that has been done on uh, Luster security features over the past years, um, we were able to implement this uh, secure namespace isolation. Uh, it relies on many different Luster uh, security features, but also on, on, on features such as the project quota one uh, for capacity management. Um, I hope that um, you were able to see that it's not that complex to implement this uh, secure namespace isolation. It requires um, some steps, but they are quite simple and uh, it gives a very flexible and powerful um, configuration in the end. And again, this is a real life use case. This uh, a quite similar configuration is already uh, in place and in production use at different customer sites. Last word to say that having a s and implementing these sec security features at the Luster level is, is, um, is super useful, but it's only it's secure only because uh, the lower layers on which Luster rely are relies are uh, secure as well. So it's about the hardware, it's about the OS, it's also about the the network. So it's really important that the layers below Luster are uh, properly configured and secured to be able to claim that with the Luster security features we have something that is secure and that in the sense that something that cannot be, you know, work, walked around by, by some malicious users in order to, to bypass everything that was uh, um, configured and planned. So that's all for the presentation. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Questions? Can you uh, explain a little bit about how hard links and sim links work with the subdirectory mounts? So um, basically, um, sim links cannot be followed when uh, the when when it points to uh, to uh, a location that is outside of the subdirectory mount. You you will get an error if you try to 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 open read from from that file, and Hard links are not really a problem. I mean, hard links, it's, it's, um, it's a different name. So if you have a hard link inside a subdirectory, then it's just like accessing a normal file in this case. So the, the expected result is that it works, simply. Well, I have a question. <laughs> Um, I saw that the tenant uh, root administrator uh, in the RBAC role will have something like change own uh, denied in many cases. And I agree with that, except that I've encountered in my own admin world where people move on, they go to different jobs, and the administrator has to transfer ownership of a project or a directory to a new user. There are two ways. They can either move it to somewhere and have a new person take it over, or sometimes they actually try to do like a user mod or something like that. Um, if th the person were even trying to do, say, a user mod thing, would the tenant root have to make a request of the overall system root to do like a, a change own at an upper level in yeah. like the tenant 100 or 101 space? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. That's, I mean, unless there is a way for, you know, the people, the that are replacing each other to to transfer uh, I don't know some some let's yeah if we consider it's different UIDs GIDs then it would uh, require some uh, you know um, uh, temporary uh, extension of their uh, um, uh, roles or it would be possible for the tenant route to um, maybe 
copy or something the the files it depends because a lot of times root users don't really have access to you know home user space yeah so because that's so one of the security things if you have a lot of your you yeah. know security procedures yeah, exactly. in place that's really dependent on, on yeah the so that, the that's why policy. i was posing the yeah. question <laughs> yeah <laughs> any other questions They're always on the <laughs> were, were you on the other side yesterday? I was on that side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question. How, how would this work uh, if you're tiering and using HSM and writing? Excuse me, can you speak up? Uh, how would this work if it was tiering and using HSM capabilities? Will, will the um, ownership and, uh, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the group IDs will be maintained? Um, across the tiers. So you d do you think of uh, some kind of uh, UID collision between the different tenants? Will it be preserved as as you're archiving and restoring? Back yeah, from I tiers? mean, in this uh, specific use case, um, I mean, the the customers were warned that uh, this could happen. This collision. Uh, in UIDs, GIDs, and they said, we are fine. This is, you know, uh, too bad for the uh, tenants if there is a, any uh, problem. But you have to realize that it's actually not a problem if there, I there are any, uh, uh, for instance, if one UID or, G or GID is, does is used in different tenants, in the end, it's, it's not an issue because as they are isolated, they are never supposed to see another tenant's data. So it's, it will not end up in any security issue if there was such a situation. Any questions? Can a single NID or NID range be a member of multiple tenants or subdirectory mounts? Yeah, that, that's a corollary, and, and this is not something that is expected. It's, it's really supposed to be different organizations, and uh, it's just that for, you know, for efficiency reasons, for, for budget, I don't know, uh, we want to use the same luster file system, but they are really supposed to be different organizations that don't talk to each other. And the, the really the idea is that for those organizations, they would ignore that they are actually using the same roster file system. So with that in mind, it's not something that we, uh, you know, having someone in, in two different organizations is not something that is uh, 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 yeah, possible. Thanks. If we have no other questions, I would like everyone to thank our speaker, uh, Sebastian Wissant.